All right, good evening, everybody. While we wait for everyone to join us, um, uh, I just wanna make sure you are all are aware of all the exciting upcoming programs we're having here at the library, and we look forward to having you soon. So I don't wanna waste our time tonight because we have so much exciting content to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. This is you're joining the Hudson Library and Historical Studies virtual author series. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome biologist and award winning nature author Danielle Claude to discuss her latest book, Koala, A Natural History in an Uncertain Future. Um, before we get started, I just want to uh, please remind everyone to check out all of our exciting upcoming programs here happening at the Hudson Library. Please visit our website, hudsonlibrary.org. At any time during the event, you can ask questions, and we're going to try to get to as many as possible. So please make sure to leave the questions in the Q&A section down below at the bottom of your screen. And like I said, we'll try to get to as many. Um, you can also purchase links. There will be a link in the chat to purchase copies of Koala, which I have here, um, from our local independent bookstore, The Learned Owl. So that look forward to that link, which will be posted shortly. And now on to tonight's speaker. Danielle Claude is a uh, biologist and award-winning nature author. Um, her writing includes natural history essays, science writing, historical fiction, and best-selling children's books, as well as documentaries. Um, her books include Killers in Eden, Voyages to the South Seas, and The Wasp and the Orchid, which was shortlisted for Australians, Australia's National Biography Award. Her latest book, Koala, A Natural History and Uncertain Future, came out last week in the US. Um, and it offers a highly insightful look into the history and future of koalas. Um, I have to say, I finished it and I absolutely loved it. It was fascinating. Um, she's joining us tonight live from Australia. Hi, Danielle. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So we'd love if you could tell us a little bit about your book and what inspired you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me. It's it's really lovely. I'm I'm really enjoying this virtual tour. I, I guess it would have been nice to come to the states um, in person, but um, failing that, this is this is the next best thing. So it's really lovely to be able to talk to people about um, my latest book. Um, so yeah, I am a na I am a nature and science writer. I, I trained in biology. I guess. Um, I guess the obvious question is, why am I writing a book about koalas? Um, I'm not a koala biologist, especially. I'm, I'm a, um, I, I did train in mammal behavior. So animal behavior was my, my degree um, and conservation biology. So that was, that was a long time ago. Um, and for many years, I've been primarily a science writer and writing books on natural history. So, so this, is, this is my 13th book. Um, I've written quite a variety of, of books. My first book was actually very much animal focused. That was Killers in Eden, which is, was about um, the orcas uh, on, that used to live on the coast of New South Wales. That's an amazing story. But um, since then, I, I often found that I ended up writing more about scientists rather than the, the science that they did. Um, so it's been a real pleasure for me to come back to animal behaviour and looking directly at the animal. And I, I really wanted to work hard on this book to make sure it was koala focused, not so much human focused. I mean, you can't write a book that doesn't, you know, it's very hard to write a book that's not about humans ultimately. <laughs> we, we are very human centric in what we do and how we think. Um, but I did want to make sure that I tried to tell the story from a koala perspective as best I could. So I, I didn't want to just stick to human history of ko koalas. I wanted to, to look at um, koala's history. So I started really early in the story. I went right back to the beginning and I wanted to look at how koalas evolved and where they came from. Um, now, of course, Koalas are often known, you know, we're all, we're all very familiar with koalas. I think koalas are such a well-known species all around the world. We're all familiar with, with you know, our lovely little fluffy toys um, of childhood. And very commonly they're called koala bears, but of course they're not bears. They're nothing, they're not related to bears at all. When Europeans first encountered koalas, they called them monkeys, sloths, lemurs, 
all sorts of strange things um, because, because they're really unlike anything else. But of course, they do belong to a, a big family of their own and they belong to marsupials. So they are pouched animals. They, they give birth to their young as tiny little jelly beans. The little jelly beans are not much bigger than your thumbnail. Um, and there's little tiny pink um, neonate crawls up the fur and into the pouch and attaches itself to the, um, to the nipple. And it basically stays there for, for quite some time growing and um, until it's ready to emerge from the pouch in what sort of becomes a second birth. So really, marsupials are remarkable in having the, the pregnancy. They really have an, an internal pregnancy and then an external pregnancy. And, and then when the, the joey emerges from the pouch, they're kind of, that's kind of the stage that most other mammals, the eutherian or placental mammals, of which which we're one, that's the stage that we would normally give birth. Um, so, so marsupials are very distinctive in that respect. Today, there's only a, you know koalas belong to a group that only contains wombats. Wombats is is the other species that's most closely related to um, living koalas, um, and you know, wombats are very different. <laughs> they don't live up trees. They, they're, they're a similar size, so the size of a sort of a, a medium a medium dog, but with very short legs. Um, and they, they live in burrows, so they're burrowing animals. They're a bit bigger than a koala, but, um, and they also don't have a tail. So, so, but they do have some characteristics that are similar to koalas. They've got the great big nose, um, the, no, the lack of the tail, and something that you wouldn't notice at first sight but is quite characteristic of both those species is that they actually have a reinforced rump so the skin on the on the rump of the koala and the wombat is really really tough and strong it's, it's called a dermal shield um, and quite a few herbivores have that that's generally a predator um, defense so that if something bites them on the on the back and grabs them it's really hard for them to get a grip of course so, so wombats certainly do use that as an anti-predator defense. Koalas are a little bit different possibly. They often use it just to sit on. So <laughs> it's a very comfortable, um, convenient cushion to have when you sit in trees during your, during your life. But they did used to have more um, relatives than that. And uh, they, they have, I actually covered those in, in another book of mine. I'll just show you this, this cover because you probably won't have seen it because it's mostly just available in Australia. I'm sorry if that's back front for you, but it's the megafauna of Australia. And you can see all these giant animals um, that Australia had. Australia didn't have mammoths and, and um, saber-toothed tigers. Um, we had giant marsupials. So um, one of the giant marsupials, which was is a closer relative to the, to the koala, was actually this one, a diprotodon. Um, and that's about two or three tons. Um, so it's a big grazing herbivore, kind of the ecological equivalent of a mammoth, I suppose. Just to give you an idea of the size, this is actually a koala skull. So you can see they're, they're, they're not a large animal. And you can see they've got these very characteristic two front teeth that stick out the front. If I show you a diprotodon tooth, I can't show you the whole diprotodon skull because it's too big. Sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is a diprotodon tooth, and you can see how that compares to this little bottom tooth here. That's very annoying. I don't often get very many phone calls on my landline. <laughs> Sorry about that. So you can anyway, you can see that the diprotodons were really huge. So they were the giants of the Oh, I think we're, you might be muted. That we had in, in, in because we don't have any um, of those megafauna, but we've just got these remnant species. So the, the koalas and the, and the wombats. So I guess that was kind of the starting point for me. It was to understand where they came from and the, the great periods of um, upheaval that koalas have gone through. They've gone through climate change and all sorts of problems. They've nearly gone extinct in the past and then come back from extinction um, and recovered. They've had a couple of 
a couple of um, periods where, you know, the, the first great extinction was when the megafauna all went extinct. And then the, the second one was really when um, human, Europeans arrived in Australia um, and they started hunting koalas for fur. So um, that was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And there were millions of pelts of koalas that were sent overseas and sent off to the fur markets in America and also in the UK and Europe. Um, and that caused you know, massive destruction um, of the koala populations. And in fact, they were declared extinct and did go extinct in South Australia, where I live, um, and nearly extinct in Victoria, another southern state. So that southern whole southern population was wiped out and they were really declining in the, um, in the northern states along the eastern seaboard. And that caused a great deal of concern and a lot of wildlife people, you know, conservation movements started then around trying to protect the koala um, and campaigning to have it protected, which it was by legislation, but it still wasn't really cutting out the, the hunting that was going on. There was still such a market for fur, but it was a very attractive thing to have happen. And we had a lot of um, people very concerned. So children's writers in particular um, became very concerned and I think I've got it here. One of these, this, this book's Blinky Bill. I don't know if you've heard of this one. It's now been made into a pretty famous um, animated cartoon series, which is distributed around the world. So you may have seen it on TV. But when it was originally published by Dorothy Wall in the 1930s, she was writing it because she was concerned about what had happened to the koalas and how they had all disappeared. So this is really... This 1930s period was really the time when koalas came into the public consciousness um, and probably also where we started to see, um, you know, the popular children's toys. In fact, it's a sad, sad element of this that the earliest toy koalas were probably made out of real koala fur, which is quite a horrifying idea. Of course, they haven't been for a long time. Um, the thing that really saved the koala then, interestingly, was the American president, Herbert Hoover, because he had colleagues in the conservation movement in Australia and they wrote to him and asked him to help them um, stop the, the fur trade. And he banned the importation of koala fur and other furs into America and that dried up the market and the koalas were finally properly protected. And since then, the koala populations have really recovered enormously. And there's a whole new population of koalas that has spread right through Victoria and South Australia where they were once extinct. It's, it's all, that's actually the strongest population we now have um, across the country, but they're still having troubles further north. So that's where you know, we had the big fires in 2019-20, and I'm sure a lot of you would have seen the um, pictures of burnt and injured koalas and the big campaign to save them. And, you know, there's a bit lot of discussion about them being endangered um, or, and at risk of extinction. And it's not that the species is at risk of extinction. Koalas are still quite abundant, but they're declining really rapidly on the East Coast. And that's a worrying trend. And we don't, you know, we need to understand why that's happening. Um, and they are at risk of localised extinction in those areas. So that's why they've been declared endangered in Victoria and, uh, not Victoria, sorry, uh, New South Wales and Queensland. Um, so the issues around why they're, they're um, having so much trouble there and not in the southern areas is a really complex one. And it's got to do a lot with, with the nature of the animal and its close relationship with the eucalypt forests, which it's highly specialized on feeding on. And it's got a very, very particular relationship with eucalypt forests. So koalas um, only eat eucalypts. They're, they're predominant, they occasionally will eat other things, but their main diet is eucalypts. Um, and, and people often think, well, that's a very specialised diet just to eat one thing. But of course, we have to remember that there are up to 900 species of eucalypts in Australia. It's a very diverse um, tree group. Um, and of those, koalas are known to eat at least 70 species. But any one koala will only eat between 
four and ten different types of eucalypts and some of them are very specialized only on one type of eucalypt so um, it, it really depends where you are what the koalas eat and that's one of the things that's really tricky about koalas is that they behave very differently in different areas and their food is very different and very specific to them so it's almost like even though all koalas are one species in each area they're highly distinctive populations that need very particular things. The main issue, I guess, with, with koalas is loss of habitat, though. So, you know, as with most um, Western cultures, we've, we've cut down a lot of the forests. Um, and in the last 200 years of Australian settlement, you know, the forest um, ecosystem has been largely disrupted, especially on the most arable, fertile lands, which are also the best areas for koalas. So koalas tend to like forests that are on river plains and closely associated with water systems. So even though their name, koala, comes from the Indigenous word meaning does not drink um, in, in direct language, it's they still highly dependent on water and their abundance is very closely linked to wet seasons. So periods of wet in Australia, which might last for five, 10, 15 years, and then you'll have periods of drought and the koalas will go up and down in numbers over those times. And they're very close, they're, they're really closely attached to those riverine forests. So the trees like the river red gums, um, swamp mahogany, the, the names tell you, that they're, they're quite, they're, they prefer a lot of water. And a lot of eucalypts do actually, they're very good at getting at the water deep down underground, even though they live in a very dry place and they're quite drought adapted. So for koalas to breed successfully, they often rely on those trees that are more productive, more nutritious and less toxic because that's the big issue with, with gum leaves is, um, and I've just got a little bunch of them I picked out of my garden this morning just to show you some of the diversity. I know they kind of you sort of think, oh, well, they all look the same. But then you get ones like this as well, which are quite different. Uh, you might have seen these in floral arrangements. They're very popular. I think if I look, it's this one here that is one of the koala's favourites. So hard for us to tell apart, but a koala knows exactly what it wants to eat. And this is a river red gum. So um, it's... it's um, a very beautiful, huge tree uh, that's that's um yeah very popular in Australia, very long lived, and they're kind of they're real nursery trees. They they contain massive amounts of biodiversity, um, including koalas. So protecting those habitat areas is really important, and actually restoring those habitat areas, I think, is the crucial thing. Not not we don't need to. We, we do need to protect them. We still have native forest logging going on in New South Wales and Queensland, and that's probably a major factor in the decline of koalas in those areas, is simply lack of protection for existing habitat, even though it's meant to be protected. Um, and human development is also encroaching on prime koala habitat. So we really need to look at how we're building our suburbs and our cities and our roads and making sure they're built with wildlife in mind we, obviously, it's not going to be perfect habitat for all wildlife, but we can make it more compatible for wildlife. And koalas are actually quite um, resilient at living with humans. In Adelaide, where I live, um, they actually have moved into the city. So there's lots of big parks and um, big old trees lining the remaining water systems, and the koalas are moving down into the city. So we just need to make sure we have systems in place to keep them safe, especially from cars and dogs, because they're quite vulnerable to those. But um, yeah, people really love having them close to their homes. Um, I thought perhaps I did want to talk a little bit, I'm just checking the time, about how, um, how I wrote the book. I mentioned that I wanted it to be a very koala focused book. It's not an information book in you know, in a, in a straight traditional scientific sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a journey. So I didn't know, I, you know, I'm familiar with koalas. I probably know a little bit more about them than the average person because of my zoology background, but I was by no means an expert when I started the book. Um, so I really wanted to answer those questions around koalas and why they're abundant here and going extinct elsewhere and how they live. 
I didn't expect this story to be an overly complicated one. Um, I actually thought it would be fairly simple and it turned out to be hugely complicated. Uh, koalas are amazingly complex animals um, and understanding them is, is, yeah, no small feat. Um, there's masses and masses of scientific work. Koalas are one of our best studied animals and they're still quite a mystery in lots of ways, which, which I think is quite interesting. So I've tried to tell that story as, as a journey through through the um, th through my discovery of their their history and prehistory, so um, you know, interspersed with personal reflections on um, on koalas, the people who work with them, and and what I've discovered, um, and especially you know, their relationship with bushfires, which represent quite a threat. And bushfires is something I've I've actually I have written about before. I've written about the history of Australian bushfires and how we can live safely with them. I live in a bushfire zone. I have mostly lived in a bushfire zone, very active in terms of community safety and, um, you know, how to protect yourselves from, from fires, which I don't know, may not be such a big issue um, where you are, but it's certainly a big issue here and, you know, in some step parts of, them, of um, the US and Canada. So, yeah, I, I guess that's that's where I'm coming from. And I've also written, uh, I interspersed the sections of the book with short passages that were written specifically from a, from a koala perspective. So from a koala point of view, um, it's not written in first person. I'm not trying to anthropomorphize. I'm just trying to describe the world from how they see it. they might see it how I think they might see it I guess so I thought I'd finish up by um, reading a little section to you um, so this is this is not the main narrative it's just the little interspersing bits in between at the top of the tallest tree the koala is enveloped in a curtain of greenery surrounded by the quiet hum of insects and the occasional discordant shriek of parrots. It has no reason to look beyond its immediate surroundings. The canopy stretches unchanging from horizon to horizon in a mosaic of olive gray, blue, green. This forested realm seems endless, sweeping down the foothills, carpeting the plains where the darkened tracks of rivers drain vein-like into valleys. <laughs> I can't believe how many phone calls I've had this morning. Before meandering across the lowlands into the expanse of open water beyond. Above the forest rise granite mountains, the igneous backbone of the eastern seaboard from north to south. The peaks frost white and snow gums entwine over open grass and heathlands. Shallow sphagnum bogs rest between submerged boulders tucked beneath mossy blankets under frigid skies. The koala rarely ventures up into the cold mountain forest. It lives on the lower slopes with a tall forest rain, a kingdom of eucalypts, ash, box, bloodwood, messmate, manna, ironbark and peppermint. Monuments to photosynthetic power, the glory of chlorophyll, 200 tonnes of biomass rising in smooth organic grey obelisks, 20, 50, 100 metres high conjured miraculously from carbon dioxide and water, the invisible and transparent made mountainous by sheer solar radiance. They are citadels of biodiversity, these trees, each branch, each hollow, each leaf, each crevice, each crack, home to legions of species, sheltering, feeding, breeding, living and dying in a continual interconnected cycle. The solitary koala is not alone in this tree, but one of many. Gliders and possums sleep in dark corners safe from the glaring eyes of powerful owls, while tiny antichinuses and feather tails cluster in colonies in cramped, low-ranking accommodation. Twittering bats pack jam into crooks and crannies. Families of parrots and pardalotes return year in, year out like annual holiday makers. Large cockatoos dominate the prime real estate of spacious penthouse hollows, sulphur-crested, yellow-tailed, pink, grey and black. Chattering flocks of small birds swoop and mob the koala with indignant cries as it munches on, oblivious to their outrage. 
The koala reaches for a leaf, sniffing carefully before biting the shaft and tugging it free of the twiglet. The leaf is astringent and the sun is too hot. The koala retreats deeper into the shade and sleeps, waiting for the cool damp night and the promise of rain. Thank you. So um, I'm hoping that you've got lots of questions for me. I'm happy to answer, answer any questions. <laughs> we have a ton of questions coming in. So I'm trying to group them in like a order so far. So if you have questions, make sure to leave them in the chat. Um, we have a couple people um, wanted to know about, let's try to see here, about um, the infant rate or mortality rate in marsupials. Is that higher among them, marsupials or not? So, so the mortality rate, did yeah, you say? Yeah, Carol would like to know about um, the mortality rate among marsupials and about like uh, their family structure. Like, do they live in families or solitary creatures? Okay, marsupials are a highly di diverse group of group of animals, so they're all very different. So there's about, um, I mean, you, you're probably most familiar with the opossums that you get in, in America. So there's one, the Virginia opossum, which is spread through North America. But there's another 120 odd species of, um, or probably more actually, of South American opossums. Um, and so they're, they're all quite divergent. But in Australia, they take even a bigger range of forms. So we've got everything from kangaroos to possums to marsupial moles to numbats. They're all really, really diverse and they all have different life histories um, and characteristics, just as many as we do in, um, you know, the eutherian and placental mammals. So, so that, so, you know, their mortality rates are, are very variable. Koalas' um, mortality rates generally are related to in, in the wild are uh, related to, well, around human habitation is cars and, and dogs. Um, disease is also a big factor. I guess in the past, it would have been predominantly disease and predation, but um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. <laughs> it does. And did, about their like family structure, you said they're mostly solitary or? Yeah, family structure is interesting. Koalas are by and large solitary, so they you only see them generally. Typically, you see them together when they have a joey. So um, you you'll see a mother and a joey, you know, in the in the wild. But once the joey gets to a certain age, they tend to move off on their own. Interestingly, that seems to be triggered. Um, probably it's partly triggered by hormones. So when the mother's got another joey on the way, but also um, it's triggered by food supply. So if if they're in, in most places, koalas have to spread out a lot. So one koala needs so much forest. It needs a forest that is the size of an average sports field for one koala. Um, and in really arid regions, some koalas require a huge forest to support them. So you might there get a forest, a, a koala that is one koala in a park, though a forest area the size of Central Park in New York. So they're incredibly dispersed animals. Having said that, in really good conditions, they will sit together in trees. If you have them in captivity, they're quite sociable. Um, apart from during the breeding season, they're not very sociable then. But um, yeah, they will often sit together and stay together and, and be quite amiable. So I think their lack of socialization is largely driven by food rather than having a problem with another animal speaking of food i thought it was fascinating to hear how many different variety of eucalyptic plants trees there are and just how few that koala will actually eat and how an individual koala just <laughs> will eat even fewer than that yeah they're unbelievably fussy eaters koalas so you know um yeah they they, they there's they might eat a lot of different species or, or a range of different species, but it's not a matter of just giving them the right species. They will um, be particular about which individual tree and um, where that tree grows. So, you know, they, they might they will re might really love a tree that grows in a gully, but not be interested in the same species of tree that grows up the hill because it's drier. And when the trees, when they're living, growing in a really um, productive, moist habitat, they produce more leaves and have fewer toxins in their leaves. 
so the leaves are much tastier and they just you know it's like growing vegetables in your garden if you if you don't water your garden enough um or, or you know it, the leaves will go bitter very quickly um and it's the same with the, with the gum trees and the koalas are highly sensitive to that because it's really hard to get toxins out of the eucalypts and they have a very specially adapted liver that allows them to extract toxins but if there's too many toxins or the leaves are not nutritious enough it really upsets their energy balance and and sometimes they can actually eat leaves that are so hard to digest that they lose energy by eating those leaves so they end up worse off than they were if they hadn't eaten anything at all that is fascinating um we have a couple questions coming in on about koalas and zoos and i thought one of the facts that i read in your book that absolutely was mind-boggling to me was how few zoos in the united states have koalas um i was we were talking before the program started and we're in ohio and ohio has two zoos that have koalas cleveland and columbus um and there's only about 10 in the entire united states that's partly because of how expensive and difficult it is to keep koalas yeah yeah so you know everybody would love to have a koala in their zoo <laughs> so, so they're a really prized animal but um you know when people first started sending koalas overseas they realized that it was incredibly difficult to keep them alive they they don't you know they have to have fresh gum leaves and from particular trees and the trees they grew up with so um you know most herbivores in the zoo are fed, fed some kind of pellet <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of generic herbivore pellet you can't do that with koalas they have to have fresh freshly cut leaves you know only a day old um so they're really really particular and that makes them really expensive and you have to have a really good supply of eucalypts of the right sort to please them so often you know koalas in the early days were sent overseas and they even if they lasted you know they'd survive for a few months then they just sicken and die um and that, you know, was, was to do with the, the diet being inappropriate. And, and they're still a little bit touchy. So, um, yeah, it, it's really expensive to keep them. They, they The first successful colonies really were in San Diego Zoo. And I'm sure that was in part because San Diego, like, you know, a lot of it, those areas had a thriving population of eucalypts that had been planted during the gold rushes uh, and later as windbreaks and as um, uh, street trees. So having pre-existing eucalypts really helped and, and they now grow a whole forest of eucalypts purely to feed the koalas, both in San Diego and also in the zoos where they send their koalas to. Yeah, I was blown away by just how expensive because they have to have fresh cut leaves, just how expensive koalas are to have in a zoo. Mm, I yeah. They <laughs> Apparently, they're one of the most expensive animals to keep, which is which is quite remarkable. I, I remember hearing a Japanese zookeeper was saying that um, it costs more to keep a koala than it does to pay the mayor of one of their major cities. <laughs> That's very impressive. And, uh, yeah, we have um, a bunch of people who wanted to know. Um, trying to see here about more about their territory and how they when you find them um are koalas found naturally in every australian state okay so koalas are, are very restricted to the um forests the eucalypt forests in particular so um we don't get them in the desert areas for example um having and and they they used to be uh previously they was they spread right across western australia and up the east coast but um, Western, you know, the, with the drying of the continent, um, the Western Australian forests became isolated and koalas have obviously died out there. So, so now they're just mostly restricted to the East Coast states. So that's Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, ACT, um, and into South Australia. So just the edge, South Australia is not very well forested, but the little pockets they've got are now have been repopulated with koalas. Um, they're not found in Tasmania. It's debatable as to whether they ever were in Tasmania. Um, my some of my paleontology colleagues tell me they think they should have been there, um, but the the fossil record's not that great and hasn't been well explored there. So you never know. We might find that they were there 
once, but they're certainly not native there now. Thank you. Um, trying to group them together. Do yeah. um, <laughs> so for we have more questions about their family um, life and um, Pat. Uh, wanted to thank you for speaking with us tonight and she would like or they would like to know how territorial koalas are and do they fight amongst themselves and will they adopt like an or orphan joey if they came across one oh that's an interesting question yeah sure so koalas um do fight for sure, absolutely the males fight but it's mostly the breeding season that this happens so so during the breeding season what happens is that the males obviously the koalas are all spread apart so they have to get together somehow so the males will bellow and they have this, if you haven't heard of koala bellow, you should look it up because it's 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 difficult to describe, but um, you know, it's it's like a deep grunting, wheezing cough. <laughs> it's quite loud. Um, and and you you start hearing that in spring in this in I I hear them here. Um, and sometimes the females bellow as well, but it's mostly the males. They find the females and males manage to come together, They're mostly the males moving around, but the females as well. Um, and the males are a bit more enthusiastic about the mating season than the females. The females are very particular about who they'll mate with, and the males seem to be not particular at all. So um, you do end up with a lot of battles going on in the trees. So the, there's a lot of grunting and squealing and screaming going on which sounds quite horrendous to be honest um, it's not the <laughs> nicest sound in the world but the females are generally seem to be pretty good at deterring the males they they they're smaller they go out further on the branches um, but it is it is a bit of a stressful time I guess um, and they actually have a system where they females don't ovulate regularly um, they ovulate in response to a male being around so they sort of need that warm-up time if you like to to get their their reproductive system on track so so that's how, that's how and that's probably a response to Australia's very um, unpredictable climate um, you know they they may, they won't breed in dry seasons and things so um that's how the mating system works. Uh, that's their level of sociability. Once once the the male's done his job, he he heads off and <laughs> looks for new pastures. So <laughs> then it's up to the female to to deal with the joey. And but like I said, they can be they can be perfectly sociable outside the breeding season. Um, and the males fight with each other. Um, they communicate. They listen to each other's bellows, and they judge how big the other males are by the by the call, so they can avoid battling big koalas. Um, they also scent mark the trees. So if you've ever seen a photo of a koala and it has a brown stripe down its white chest, that's a male, and that's its scent gland. So they they will mark the trees, and koalas will typically sniff trees before they go up them to see if there's another koala present and whether or not it's a koala they want to associate with or not. So, um, so they communicate chemically a, a lot. Uh, so, so that's how they distribute themselves, how they get together. Um, and male koala fighting is, is it's like, um, they're like rest, wrestlers. If they're down on the ground, they, they're quite, they, you know, it, they're quite sturdy little creatures, um, very thick fur. So they, they don't, in, yeah. The males do get injured during the breeding season, but but they are quite robust generally. Sounds good. Do they ever? Um, we have two questions about joeys coming in. Do they ever adopt if there's if they come across oh, yes. a joey? Yeah, certainly. I do know that. I'm, I'm not too sure about. I, I, I think yeah, it's an interesting question. I suspect so. Um, they do if if a you you can actually a friend of mine who's a very um, experienced koala researcher says you can get females to come down from trees by imitating a joey. So you can actually call, call them. Um, she's obviously very good at this. I don't think that would work if I tried that. But, <laughs> but she said that, that they are concerned about joeys and will come down um, to check them out. So I, I would imagine that's a possibility. I can't say I, I know of any particular examples of that. Um, it possibly does happen. Um, joeys are very affectionate animals and like like human babies and primates they need a lot of physical affection there because they spend their life clinging to their mother after after they've grown in the pouch then they, they cling to their mother 
And so if they are orphaned, they will want to hold on to something. And, and that's a universal thing for koalas. They now, when koalas go into, have, if they have to go into surgery or, or some sort of medical treatment where they've been anaesthetized, they will actually put the koala on a, on a koala log, which is a rolled up, often a you know, rolled up padded log or rolled up towels, so that when the koala wakes, it, it's got something to hang on to because koalas get very distressed if they don't have something to grip onto, that the trees are, or their mother are very important to them. And, and that that's really promotes a lot of some of the appeal koalas have to us, I think, because they have that, that need for physical contact. Yeah, I like the part of the book where you were talking about like um, if the it was a koala that was on the ground and the zookeeper, they just the koala just reached their hands up. See yeah. the time and the zookeeper just would pick them up and hold them. It, I was like, I see the appeal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they, they do elicit a very strong parental response mm -hmm. in humans. But we have to remember that's about us more than the koala. Right. <laughs> I like you said, you might be seeing us just more as a tree. Um, <laughs> um, Lee would like to know how, what role the males play in raising the young or protecting their territory. Do they play a role or if at all? No. no. None whatsoever. <laughs> None whatsoever. They're not particularly, I mean, they, they do during the breeding season, they, they, you know, fight with each other and keep other males away, but they're not, they're not territorial in the sense of defending a territory. They, they simply avoid each other, I think, is, is more the case. Um, and, and so I, I guess you could, can sometimes get battles between koalas and trees, you know, this is my tree, me, go away. Um, but, but it's not it's not as overt as it is in other animals where you have strict territories. They more just have home ranges that they occupy, and that's where they're commonly found. And they they vary depending on where they are. So in the richer forests in the south, you'll get overlapping home ranges between males and females, and some of the females will overlap as well. And in the more arid areas, they're much more separated and apart. And it's probably just related to food quality. Very interesting. We have, um, actually, speaking of what we were talking about before, Joey would like to know, how do they react when they encounter humans in the wild and versus or and or captivity? Yeah, okay. So uh, it's interesting. I mean, koalas, like most wild animals, prefer to keep their distance from people. But they, they seem to actually quite like watching them. I think it's a feature of an animal that lives in trees um, and doesn't have a lot of lot to do <laughs> but they they do actually quite like watching humans but if they notice that you're watching them they'll sort of you know move around the other side of the tree and and so they're not quite so visible so so they do move away um most commonly that that is their most common response but you know they don't feel the need to move away too far and and i do know uh one of the local rangers who spends a lot of time in the parks says that she reckons she sees koalas on the in the trees on the tracks more often than off the tracks in the in the vegetation which is an interesting observation I've never heard anybody actually look at that scientifically but she thinks that they like watching people um, you know that people they entertain and they're certainly quite curious animals so they they do on occasion approach other people um, sometimes they approach people because they're sick um, so if they're looking for water, they will often come down to people's houses, but sometimes they just come down to people's houses because the house is in the way, you know, and, and especially if there's a window or a glass door, they'll try and get through the door. So um, there's plenty of stories of people in the area I live in where, you know, there's a koala at the door, they open the door and the koala walks happily through the house and out the other side and that's what it wanted to do. So, <laughs> you know, they, they are, they're, not, they're quite amiable animals in that sense. Um, but, but you do notice, if you watch them carefully, you do notice they they are cautious with people and, and like to keep their distance. Sounds good. I have, actually, we have so many really interesting questions, so I'm trying to get to as many. Um, one of the parts of the book that I thought was fascinating, um, especially because I didn't know much about it, um, was about the prehistoric form of koalas. And we have someone in the chat who would like to know, you touched on it, was about the evidence of prehistoric form of koalas. What did that look like? Um, 
you explained a bit too. Yeah, sure. Um, the yeah, the prehistoric koalas. Yeah, we we tend to, you know, we tend to think a koala is a koala is a koala. You know, it's it's so distinctive um, and unlike the other marsupials. Um, you know, it's not like a kangaroo, which comes in a whole range of different forms and different species. There are lots of species of kangaroos and wallabies. Um, so it's kind of hard for us to imagine what prehistoric koalas must have been like. And part of the problem is that the fossil record in Australia is generally quite poor. Um, the conditions for fossilization are just not great and there's quite a lot of erosion. So we don't have good fossil records the way other countries do. So most of the records for koalas, in fact, pretty much all of them at the moment, is just a tooth um, or two <laughs> or a few um, and a bit of jawbone. So um, it's, you know, you know, there's a lot you can tell from a tooth. You can tell how big the animal is. You can tell what kind of food it probably ate. Um, and you can certainly tell what, what, what family it belonged to because the teeth are very distinctive. But other than that, um, we can't really tell all that much about what the koalas were like. So we know that a lot of the early koalas were really small, um, you know, more possum sized than koala sized. Um, and they varied a bit. And we do know that there was one giant koala. So there was one that was about uh, three times the size of a modern koala, which is quite a hefty beast. Um, so probably possibly up to 30 kilos, uh, whereas modern koalas range between six and 12 kilos, depending where they are. They're smaller in the north and bigger in the south where it's colder for us. So, so that's a pretty standard size difference. So we don't really know much more than that. Um, we'll just have to wait and hope that somebody soon finds a koala skeleton or some more bones that we can make some more, um, be more aware of it. And until then, we tend to depict prehistoric koalas as just different sized koalas, <laughs> like we've got today, which is not very imaginative, I have to say. No, but it's fascinating. Um... We do have a lot of questions also coming in about what conservation efforts look like going forward and about how the koala population after the bushfires, um, what does that population look like now and what does the future, I guess, what effort, what's being done for the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's two things for koalas. Obviously, climate change is a major threat for koalas, not simply because it's increasing the risk of drought in, in most parts of Australia and because it's also increasing the severity and frequency of bushfires, um, but also because we, we and one thing we don't know is how it's going to impact on the trees themselves and rising CO2 and the impact that has on the level of toxins and nutrition in the trees. So there are some concerns around that, that you know, the koala's energy balance is quite fine. If the trees become slightly more toxic, that will work out a large part of their food supply. So th that's the big threat. Um, the second big problem and more, more immediate problem, if you like, is um, forest loss. Um, and, you know, the East Coast states do still have uh, an ongoing problem with, with forest native forest logging. Um, which is generally a pretty poor return industry held up by government subsidies. Um, and we really need to move, transition that industry pretty swiftly into plantation forestry. Um, and that's been a, something that we've meant to have been working on for the last 30 years and it hasn't really progressed, which is really disappointing. But th that is the major issue um, and protection of those native forests. Also clearing for agriculture and for housing is, is a major problem there too. So we, we need to look at those, those factors. They're the two big things. And on top of that, there's disease um, and there's major research going on into vaccines, into the major diseases impacting East Coast koala populations. That's primarily um, vaccination against chlamydia, which is a really widespread and devastating illness that koalas are suffering from, um, probably exacerbated by retroviruses which cause a koala AIDS um, so that's a bit of an epidemic for them at the moment it's probably exacerbated by habitat stress though so the better we can make their habitat the better it is for them and and for us too to be frank um, I'm, I know that the book implies like the conservation efforts do they and how the koalas were named on the endangered species list is I guess um, we have people wanting to know, like, 
what do current conservation are they working on trying to spearhead i guess going as the deforestation yeah so yeah there's a lot of pressure around the, the, the um forest issues and koalas are a highly politicized issue at the you know currently and particularly in new south wales there's been a whole political debate called the koala wars where you've you've got people who would like the forest to be protected and the koalas to be protected versus um interest groups in forestry and farming who who want to continue exploiting those forests so you know they're, they're quite that's a really quite a big political debate in in Australia at the moment and you know New South Wales is about to go to an election so um you know vote koala is a big hashtag <laughs> at the moment um we do find that you know overseas pressure does have a big impact in Australia so so those things are important koalas are a major tourism draw card for Australian states so you'd hope that that alone would be enough to make sure they're protected but you know there's a lot of um, public and private campaigning and fundraising for reserves um, so Australian Wildlife Conservancy has just recently purchased land to protect koala forests um, there have been promises to establish a great national koala park which is an area in the new northern new south wales region where which is um, particularly important area for koalas um but they koalas are not endangered as a species but the reason they're declared endangered in in three states in australia is because they're declining rapidly in those states um and that's a major cause for concern so it's the speed of the decline that's the problem there um, and we do need to look very closely at what what's causing that and how we can turn that around. All right, thank you. Uh, we have time for, I think, maybe two more questions before tonight. And there's so many interesting ones and I wanna thank everyone for submitting. Um, Mary Lou um, wanted to ask a quick question about the association between plants and animals often benefit both. Do the koalas provide any benefit to the trees? Oh, that's a good question. Uh... I'm not. I don't think they do any harm to the trees. Um, there are problems with koalas when they um, become too abundant, and it is a problem in the southern forests where koalas are very abundant. And I suspect this is also a feature of fragmentation of the forests that they they get trapped in these small islands of suitable habitat, and they don't seem to be able to disperse away. And they will out eat their their trees so they have killed areas of forest from having too many in the one spot so overpopulation is a problem in those areas ironically um as to benefits i, I couldn't really say other they do produce 200 droppings a day so i'm sure that has some major role to play in the um, in the uh, nutrient cycle of the forest and eucalypt leaves are very hard to break down so they they survive you know they lie on the on the ground for an awfully long time i think i talk in the book about how hard it is to compost them they're they're really difficult to to break down they, you know so so i guess koalas would would play an important role in that Okay, thank you. Um, right before we end up tonight, I know that the book was so fascinating and I highly encourage you everyone to check it out. Um, I put the link to purchase the book from the Learned Owls in the chat below. Um, what was something, I guess, as you're researching this book that you uncovered that, um, I guess, that you didn't know about koalas before or a myth that you uncovered? Yeah, there's a, there's a load of myths. I think one of the most widespread one that takes a variety of forms is that koalas are a bit slow and stupid, um, um, and that you know that that they they it takes you know some people say oh they've got a small brain, their brain doesn't occupy the whole um, the whole of their skull, it just rattles around in there. Um, that they they are stoned, um, that they you know they're intoxicated on eucalypts, and that's why they sleep all the time. None of none of these things are true. Um, koalas have a perfectly normal mammal brain, marsupial brain, um, for their size. Um, it's, a, it's an average sized brain for an animal of that size, so there's nothing unusual about that. It takes up the full space in their brain cavity. Um, it, they're, not, they're definitely not 
intoxicated or stoned on eucalyptus. Um, they are their livers that remove the toxins from the eucalypts are supercharged for removing any drugs from their system, whether that's medicines or anything else. So uh, that's that's not what's going on. If you went and poked a sleeping koala in a tree, you'll find that it's very alert and probably very angry. So <laughs> it's not advisable to do that. It would wake up very swiftly and they can move quite fast actually. Um, they, 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 you know, you don't think of them as being acrobatic, but they're, they're highly mobile in the trees. It's just that they're not awake for very long. Um, and the, the reason they're not awake for very long is, is not because they can't be. It's not because their food's not nutritious. It's the same sort of nutrition a sheep or a goat gets from eating grass. Um, it's actually because um, they can sleep. They're, they're safe in their trees. They they can they've got all they've got a, a full buffet of food around them. So once they're up a tree, they tend to stay there. They they eat their fill, lie back, have a relax, and they do relax very comfortably in trees, as I'm sure you've seen photos of them doing so. Um, and they chill out. So they're just like a cat or a dog that doesn't need to be active for very long to get its nutrients, and then it sleeps the rest of the time. Um, so I, I think they got a pretty good life, really. They have the luxury of sleeping. I do. <laughs> well, Dan, I would like to thank you so much for joining this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you, everyone else, for joining us. And I highly encourage you to check out Koala, a natural history in an uncertain future. Thank you for having me and thank you for joining. That's been lovely to, to talk to everybody tonight. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. And we look forward to seeing you at a future program. Goodbye, everyone.